Okay, well, I welcome you all to the first um, Communication Commons for Semester 2. Um, our first speaker is um, Peter Murphy, who's the Associate Professor in Communications. He has um, been writing intensively, fairly intensively, on, on the higher education institution over the last um, six months, year, on, on various aspects of higher education. And this particular paper, No More How Green Was My Valley, Mobility and, boredom, and the Boredom of High Achievement in the Age of Near Universal Access, is a response to edu current educational policy, um, Monash, but I think in, 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 in general across the, the, the education sector. So I'll hand it over to Peter. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, this paper will more or less speak for itself. Um, the only thing that I will say about it is, yes, I have been doing a lot of writing on the universities in recent times, and to the point where I just recently decided that this will probably, uh, is very swiftly becoming a book on the nature of the university. Um, okay. Um, this, is about, this is a 50-minute paper, um, and because I'm, I'm, I hope it's going to be a 50-minute paper because um, I'm, I'm feeling slightly unwell today. I'm feeling more than slightly unwell. I'm feeling actually very unwell. Um, so if I'm, I take it a little bit longer, it's because I'm, I'm, I'm feeling poorly. So you have to take that into account. Um, Richard Llewellyn's How Green Was My Valley uh, was one of the most influential novels of the 20th century. Set in a poor Welsh coal mining town and told from the standpoint of the academically gifted Hugh Morgan, Llewellyn's melodramatic tale popularised two ideas. The first idea was that great books symbolised the promise of emancipation from bleak, bleak lives lived in hardship and toil. The second idea was that with education, the children of those who performed back-breaking work could become lawyers and doctors. John Ford's 1941 film of Llewellyn's novel shows the bookshelf of young Hugh's home lined with Treasure Island, Boswell's Life of Johnson, Pickwick Papers and Ivanhoe. Hugh is the first in his family to attend a national school. When Hugh graduates, he receives a, a certificate written in Latin and is congratulated by his father for having achieved honours. What will it be, his father asks, to Cardiff, to school, then to university, to be a lawyer, is it, or a doctor? For someone like Hugh Morgan's father, the age of post-industrialism signalled the end of brutal, back-breaking work. If jobs could not be efficiently mechanised, they were exported to other countries. Ironically, uh, when, the, when time came to shut down the pits in Margaret Thatcher's England, the miners' union fought tooth and nail against it. Nostalgia trumped historical necessity. Still, the inevitable happened anyway. The traditional working class shrank and the professional managerial class grew. But so did the numbers of service jobs and low-level administrative positions. In the United States, in 1950, the traditional industrial working class made up 50% of the workforce. By 1999, it had shrunk to 25%. The service class had grown to 43%. In his well-known study, The Rise of the Creative Class, um, Richard Florida claimed that 30% of the American workforce was now a creative class of workers, although he hedged this with a much more realistic claim that 12% of the workforce made up a core creative class. The 12% figure aligns closely with the 15% of the adult 25 to 64-year-old population that, it is presumed here, might usefully graduate from university with a degree. For most of the 20th century, the number of persons working in elite and professional science and art occupations, or arts occupations, broadly aligned with the numbers of university graduates in the population, rising from around 2% at the turn of the century to 5% in 1960 and 9% in 1990. The period from 1990 to 2010 saw a marked divergence between these two sets of numbers. This divergence was fuelled by the enthusiasm for the knowledge economy as the image of a post-industrial society became inflamed. The consequence of this was that many of those 
um, encouraged in the idea that they were destined for the professions by virtue of getting a degree, ended up in service and basic administrative jobs. Even if sometimes they're patted on the head and told that they belong to a creative class of post-industrial employees, glorified labels cannot hide the reality. The university conspicuously failed to produce a universal class. Even more tellingly, it failed to produce what it could produce, a universal intellect. Uh, the mythology of How Green Was My Valley linked education to social aspiration. It did so in a manner that has characterised all debates about education since. It inferred that education was the means of creating a new kind of mobility that would lift human beings up socially and spiritually. In Llewellyn's novel, the young Hugh reads John Stuart Mill and Dr Johnson and studies Pericles. It would be virtually impossible today to find any contemporary social justice document that recommended the same. Yet Llewellyn provides, in a nutshell, a perfect account of any, how any bright person ascends in the world. From the age of the Mechanics Institutes onwards, education fueled social and geographical, or geographic mobility was meant to be ennobling. It was, thought possible to both, it was thought possible to both emancipate human beings from a life of labour and enrich the mind. Societies with advanced economies have mostly achieved the former, but what about the latter? Lawyers and doctors and students generally are trained in terrific professional skills in contemporary universities, yet frequently the brightest of those students, including the modern-day Hughes, are bored. The underlying reason for this is that universities today, for the most part, are universities only in name. 15,000 institutions around the world title themselves universities. Most of these operate on the principle of schooling. Schooling involves the transmission and reception of knowledge. The principle of schooling has long played a significant and important part in tertiary education. Historically, colleges and, to an extent, institutes provided advanced schooling in a range of specialised professional, technical and liberal arts disciplines. The United States has maintained the college-university distinction to a point. Elsewhere, it has fallen into abeyance. University is a high-status word, and status trumps almost everything else. Even in the United States, where tertiary colleges are popular, the number and kinds of universities have proliferated. In many respects, the word university has become meaningless. In turn, many have adapted to the inflation of language by using qualifying words. So now we have begun to talk about research universities and even, again in the United States, research universities with very high research activity. <laughs> it now takes a prolonged mouthful to hint at a fundamental distinction. So... Hmm. Uh, Self-appointed institutional clusters, such as Australia's Group of Eight Universities or the United Kingdom's Russell Group and the G5, have emerged to sell home the point. These groupings allude to something, namely the substantive idea of the university, that they themselves have great difficulty articulating beyond the somewhat prosaic fact that these institutions produce most of the measurable research in their respective societies. Bar one or two of their number, they can barely say what it takes to produce that research because under the impressive social policy they've been turned inside out and have lost sight of the animating spirit and constitutive core of the university. Thus, the question remains, what is a university? The answer to that question is very simple. A university is an institution that exists to advance knowledge. It is not a school, it is not a college. The primary purpose of a university is not to transmit knowledge, but to create knowledge. All of its functions, uh, teaching, research, administration and service, are, geared, are all geared to that end. The advancement of knowledge occurs through imagination, reason, objectivation and self-formation. Knowledge at its source has first to be imagined or conceptualised. Abstraction, pattern and form... In short, ideas are the principal media of the imagination. Having been imagined or conceived, an idea then has to be explained. Explanation is a function of reason. Words are the primary medium of reason. Third, knowledge has to be objectivated. 
It has to enter the world as an artefact, joining together with the other artefacts, some intellectual and some functional, some abstract and some concrete, that make up the world that we inhabit. The artefactual character of knowledge is essential in order that knowledge can be easily validated, replicated, transmitted and distributed, the latter so that others can be schooled in it. There are various media of intellectual objectivation, articles, books, papers, reports and lectures, together with the apprentice media of the undergraduate essay and the graduate thesis, a primary among them. Under certain very specific conditions, artworks join their ranks. Fourth, the creation of knowledge is the product of a process of self-formation. The apparatus of formal inst instruction, which is primarily a function of the transmission of knowledge, plays a relatively small role in preparing someone to create knowledge. A university is an institution that takes that into account. Most of all, it is a place where intellectual self-formation is possible. In the post-industrial era, two things happen to the universities. First, the distinction between a university and a college was blurred. Underline this was the blurring of the distinction between the transmission and the advancement of knowledge. This change was driven by governments eager to prove their social policy credentials. They used public financing to re-engineer the character of the university. Note, though, that public financing was the means, not the end of this action. It's wrong to assume that the transformation of the universities was a form of economic rationalisation. In fact, the averse is true. Governments transformed what had been historically a very tiny call on the public purse into an orgy of spending, much of which, as will become clear, has been systematically wasted. In short, in the post-industrial era, universities became a tool of social policy. To the extent that this happened, the ability of the universities to satisfy the most inquiring minds accordingly diminished. Successful social engineering progressively decimated the ecology of the imagination and reason in the traditional university. The kinds of eccentric, wide-ranging, freewheeling, difficult and demanding intellectual modes, milieu and media necessary for the most gifted students from all backgrounds to flourish have struggled to survive. The most productive, which in many cases meant the most astringent intellectual forms shrank into oblivion. Uh, many of these modes and media were informal. They ranged from meticulous commentary on the work of top students to serious student staff intellectual, aesthetic and political societies. These were subsumed in a borg like manner by the deathly dull, exquisitely pedestrian media of textbooks, unread weekly readings for mass tutorials and megaphone lecture courses. Not only did the formal media of instruction increasingly squeeze out the informal media of the imagination, the nature of formal instruction itself changed as the art of the lecture became progressively bureaucratised. A symptom of this was the rise to ubiquity of the intellectually anaesthetising PowerPoint slide. Traditional note-taking in lectures was an, an, an apprenticeship in intellectual creation. It taught, by example, generations of students how to compose an argument or explanation simply by having them discover for themselves on the run the skeletal structure of an argument or explanation. This was an essential part of intellectual self-formation. Some of the greatest works of the mind of the last two centuries have been compiled with the aid of student notes, including Hegel's lectures on religion, history and aesthetics. The rich milieu of mid-century University of Sydney, dominated by the ferocious intellect of John Anderson, yielded up Anderson's lectures on metaphysics published from the notes of his students. Borg pedagogy has became the default of university education simply because it was the only way that universities could deliver on the political goals that emerged in the late 1980s. These goals were fiercely audited by governments. 
Political actors of all stripes made extravagant promises to enhance social mobility and status climbing by increasing participation in higher education. Around 1988, an invisible limit was passed in most OECD countries. After that point, greater participation in the universities principally served to marginalise and frustrate higher-level intellectual formation. Despite commonplace assumptions, the larger social utility of this has either been marginal or non-existent, as will be demonstrated in a moment. A contemporary undergraduate uh, will tell you that study is easy for the intellectually gifted, yet it is also soporific. Today's B-plus student back in 1966 or 1972 was a C-student. Apply the standard distribution bell curve to the work of 8% of the population and thence to 24% of the population, and that is what you get. You can do everything correctly to advance knowledge and still find that it moves backwards. In the end, a paradox is created. Everyone wants a glittering prize, but in order to achieve it, the glittering prize has to be destroyed. In 2009, Australia's Labor government announced a plan to raise the number of Australian university graduates from 32% to 40% of the 24 to 35 age cohort by 2025. That represents a prospective rise in the percentage of graduates in the total Australian population from the current 24% to approximately 30%. That latter figure is between two and four times what is sensible. If this was being modelled from scratch, a figure for university graduate numbers of 8% of the total population and another 8% of college graduates would be about right. Australia had already passed that threshold by 1997. The implication of this is that there are too many students in Australian universities. Outwardly, it's, it would seem politically impossible to shrink the number of places in higher education. In a partial sense, this is true. It is unlikely that we will see the total number of places in higher education shrink in the foreseeable future. Even though, as I will point out later, it is far from clear that investing in education has the kind of social benefit frequently claimed for it. What is very likely to happen, though, across the OECD countries in the coming era is a shrinking of publicly funded places. This is because most of those countries paid for a massive expansion in higher education in the period between 1988 and 2008 on the national credit card. The global financial crisis in 2008, uh, followed by the sovereign debt crisis in 2010, has ensured that, for a generation hence, there will be no more expansion of higher education funding by deficit spending. We have entered an age of austerity. The long, arduous and painful return of OECD states to budgetary surplus pro provides now a very different political context for thinking about the university. A context, though, is just that, a context. What demands rethinking root and branch is the rationale for the post-1988 expansion of publicly funded higher education. This is not a question of the virtues of the market versus the state. That debate is a red herring. The policy of the endless expansion of public places invites fundamental rethinking because, by its own standards, it is a gross failure. The post-industrial promise for higher education was that government would deliver a greater, ever-inflating rate of participation and ever higher levels of social inclusion. Despite the multiplication of student places, both of these goals have proved remarkably elusive. In practice, very large numbers of students either drop out or get third-rate degrees and end up in jobs for which they do not require a degree. By those criteria, at present, half of the students in Australian universities are there in a phantom sense only. The official estimate is that 28% of undergraduate students permanently drop out from university study. Another 23% who graduate end up in jobs that don't require a degree. That is a cumulative total of 50% of students for whom university is effectively a waste of time. 
At any time, under most conditions, it is reasonable to assume that 10% of otherwise capable students will drop out of university or reject professional work for existential reasons. That is unavoidable. But a figure of 50% is another matter altogether. As to the question of social inclusion, Australia's federal government commissioned the A Fair Chance for All report in 1990. That report recommended the standard post-industrial phalanx of equity plans, objectives, targets, monitoring, measuring performance and the tying of funding arrangements to these. What was the result when these were implemented? Participation by all disadvantaged groups in higher education in Australia remained unchanged between 1989 and 2007. Interestingly, A Fair Chance for All, it's the 1990, 1990 report, reported that there had been little change in the socio-economic profile of students starting higher education over the period 1970 to 1985. That is to say, nothing has changed since 1970, in effect. In short, all of the post-industrial participation and inclusion policies are an illusion, even if an astonishingly expensive illusion. The reason that these policies have failed, and at a staggering at a staggeringly high cost, I will add, is that tertiary study is not for everyone. Universities, in the classic sense of that word, are places for small numbers. No social policy can engineer it otherwise. The only effective way of reducing attrition and non-completion rates is to make sure that those who are entering university at whatever level are intellectually suited to it and it also to them. This is a mysterious nexus and one that resists a pot pat policy translation. The nexus is uh, partially conditioned by the intellect and motivation of the aspiring student. It is partly conditioned by the capacity of the university to provide a suitable environment for those who have a gift for working with symbols and abstractions. Unsurprisingly, 30 to 40 per cent of Australian undergraduates consistently over the decade between 1999 and 2009 reported that they were unhappy or ambivalent at university. Low academic achievement st strongly correlates with dissatisfaction. It is unsurprising then that 28% of Australian undergraduates drop out. How could it be otherwise? What needs to be emphasised though is that the figure of a third of Australian undergraduates dropping out has been consistent and unchanged over four decades. When the shift from elite to mass higher education started at the end of the 1960s, the pattern was established. It was a byproduct of the social decision to enrol more than 8% of 19-year-olds in university. The subsequent growth in the participation rate to 35% of 19-year-olds affected the absolute number that drop out, but not the relative number. The latter is a constant. The slew of reports and official recommendations over the years and the creation of quality assurance bureaucracies that have followed have not made an iota of difference to the pattern. This, though, has not deterred policymakers. In their eyes, the post-industrial university is there simply to serve social policy ends. All of the major and most of the minor reports on the Australian university since the 1980s, which I've had the displeasure recently to read, have been obsessed with fixing social problems. Yet, no matter what policy has been devised, each and every one has failed comprehensively. Two things characterise all of these reports. The first is how infrequently they mention thinking, reasoning or ideas, as if those were the very last thing a university might be concerned with. In the 2008 Bradley Review of Higher Education, which I think is the worst document I have ever read on the university in my life, and that is saying something. I, I recommend everybody actually read the document. It is a truly appalling um, work. In the 2008 Bradley Review of Higher Education, there are only three references to thought or thinking and three references to ideas in the entire 304-page document. There is no chance then that university policy might be burdened by anything as irksome as the intellect. 
The second notable thing about these reports is their historical amnesia. And this is very worrying. Uh, the data they use typically goes back 10 years, no more. Their social science is very shoddy. Um, these reports exist in a perpetual present in which the failed recipes of the past can be unconsciously repeated ad nauseum. The following is a classic example of this merry-go-round. Animated by various post-industrial ideologies promising a knowledge society in a clever country, Australia increased its higher degree research population from 8,300 in 1989 to 40,000 in 2006. The metastatic accompaniment of this was a non-completion rate for HDRs nationally of less than 50%. Hmm. The auditing of this then brought in its wake much institutional hand-wringing and various vacuous schemes for mediating and monitoring postgraduate progress. Yet, as it turns out, 45 to 50% attrition is the universal rate for PhDs in comparable countries. Not only that, but this phenomenon is extraordinarily long-standing. That is, it is a normal, or if you prefer, a chronic state of affairs. No intervention will fix it. It is the rationality of the real. In a well-known study in 1982, Tinto noted that after 80 years of attrition research in higher education in the United States, and billions of dollars spent trying to improve completion rates, the rate remained constant across the period at around 45%. Historical amnesia has allowed administrators and policy makers to aggressively inflate the participation rate in universities without any hint of perspective. In 1985 in Australia, 15% of 19-year-olds were at university, in 1995, the figure was 23%. In 1997, 25%. In 2000, 34%. The Labor government in 2009 projected an effective increase to 50% by 2025. Participation has exploded across the last quarter century, yet participation has proved to be a revolving door. The portion of 19-year-olds attending universities has more than doubled in a generation, a phenomenal increase, but half the, of those 19-year-olds will end up leaving university without a degree or um, finding employment. I'm losing my place. Um, uh, let's see. The proportion of 19-year-olds attending Australian universities has more than doubled in a generation, a phenomenal increase. But half of those 19-year-olds will end up leaving university without a degree or finding employment for which a degree is not needed. As noted previously, this is a serious fiscal waste and a serious social waste. The wastage cannot be altered by additional spending. It is, uh, it is the academically weak universities in Australia that have the largest attrition rates. The annual attrition rate of most of these universities ranges between 20% and 32%. That is a sobering figure. The annual attrition rates of the, the uh, rates of the group of eight research universities range between 9% and 19%. These are significantly better. The UK government recently spent £800 million pounds over five years, from 2003 to 2008, to fix the dropout rate. This had zero effect. It cannot be otherwise. Chronic non-completion rates have justified increased auditing of universities. An intellectual problem thus is met with an administrative solution. Unsurprisingly, the only effect of auditing has, to, has been to increase the administrative burden of universities. The growth of management was the most distinctive sociological effect of the introduction of Australia's unified national higher education system in 1989. In fact, the rise of the minor profession of management to a commanding social position is one of the key sociological stories of the whole post-industrial era. 
Much of the administrative growth in the universities was fuelled by legal requirements to address and report on government targets and standards. Between 1988 and 2008, the central cost of universities grew from 25% to 50% because governments demanded procedural solutions to insoluble academic problems that were produced by government policies in the first place. This roundabout is typical of post-industrial social policy. It routinely offers non-solutions at great cost to insoluble problems that it has defined into existence. The most important condition of public policy is to understand what can be changed and what cannot be changed. A society can perfectly well choose to move beyond the older, mid-20th century threshold of 8% of the population with degrees. This makes a certain amount of sense given that the minor professions, such as teaching, journalism and management, routinely recruit from the intellectually most able 15% of the population. Colleges of advanced education in Australia once served this need proficiently. A society that makes such a choice, though, also has to be clear-eyed that once it passes the 8% threshold, a 30% attrition rate will follow as night follows day. Furthermore, it has to be aware that when the global participation rate rises beyond 15% of the population, the cost of this attrition at scale becomes prohibitive or alternatively the resulting reduction in sector quality across the board driven by cost pressures becomes counterproductive. The reason for the thresholds of 8% and 15% is simple. A university is a place for higher order thinking, for sustained, rigorous, abstract thinking, reasoning and speculation. Everyone has a speculative side, but only about 15% of the population has some gift for it, meaning that they enjoy it and pursue it with some degree of frequency. About 8% of the population, roughly the percentage of those who today undertake some kind of postgraduate study, have an elevated gift for abstraction and speculation. They can sustain it day in, day out, class after class, without being bored by it. About 2% will make high-level intellectual contributions in the arts, sciences and professions. The gift for high-order high thinking, like all gifts, is not universal. Just as in the same way the gift for courage or kindness, manual dexterity or technical adeptness is not universal. As a teenager, I learnt piano and woodworking. I thoroughly enjoyed both and have benefited all my life from having done so. I always look at the joinery on cabinetry with special affection. But I would have been horrified if someone had suggested to me that I had the making of a concert pianist or a cabinet maker. One of the most important things in life is to know one's limits. That we are good at some things and not good at others is what makes us who we are. An illusion common in modern social philosophy is a belief that everything is possible. It is not. If I was recruiting an army, I would not look first to my colleagues, nor if I was running a charity. Sorry, guys. While everyone is capable of courage and charity, not everyone has a gift for such things. So societies at a certain point have to be selective. Thus we place a certain portion of the population in universities. To, other, to others who apply, we say no. But what portion? If it is not 100%, then it is, is it 50%, 25%, 15%? Sometimes it's argued that human beings can be educated in anything. This is not true, though. The human persona is not infinitely plastic. For those who deal systematically in symbolic relations and abstractions, the direct testing of those capacities, IQ tests notably, give us some pretty useful empirical rules of thumb. The core of the university professoriate, for example, is recruited from the ranks of those with the highest 2% IQ scores. The traditional professions like law, engineering and medicine recruit heavily from the top 8%. Uh, the lesser professions like accountants, pharmacists, nurses and managers recruit extensively from the top 15%. No one mandates this. It is an empirical pattern, not a social norm. This is Hegel's rationality of the real. It is the is that matters, not the ought. 
what counts are facts, not norms. The is in this case was measured statistically for the first time by the US Army during the Second World War. The Army undertook the large-scale recording of IQ scores of service personnel. The results were able to be mapped against records of prior civilian occupation. The landmark Harrell and Harrell study in 1945 reported the resulting correlations of IQ and occupation. The correlation of measurable intelligence and occupation has been regularly confirmed in subsequent studies by Vernon, Jenks, McCall, Brody, Hernstein and Murray. It is important to understand that the empirical pattern that is observed is not something socially prescribed or politically legislated. Rather, it is the informal outcome of innumerable micro-affordances and constraints. The pattern that emerges does so ad hoc from an infinite range of social acts of grading, awarding, honouring, streaming, interviewing and so on. This empirical pattern is resistant to social engineering. The rationality of the real is very powerful. Consequently, it makes sense if the intake into the universities broadly aligns with this. Not to do so is simply self-defeating and wasteful. No social policy can meaningfully change the empirical pattern any more than there is going to be a social future in which everyone ends up as a manager or a professional. Such a future in any event would be hideous. Like all modern utopias, it is simply a function of the projection by elites of their own anxieties and fantasies onto the general population. Apologies to Andrew. People often make an erroneous assumption when it is suggested that smaller, not larger numbers belong at university. They assume that the claim being made is that all social goods should go to smart people, that is, those who deal fluently in symbols and abstractions. This, if true, would be a meritocratic dystopia, but it is not true. The reality is that there are many powerful criteria for distributing the social rewards of income, status, location, power, honour and office. These include everything from athletic ability, capacious memory, manual stamina, purpose, purposefulness, diligence, motivation and genetic inheritance, to moral virtue, charisma, beauty, skill, general intelligence, academic achievement and even good luck. Which social good should be allocated on what basis is a matter of enduring dispute. The general question of justice cannot be resolved here. It is difficult enough to answer the question of who should get publicly funded university places. What is clear is that intelligence is only one among many factors that determine that determines who gets what who gets what when. For many purposes, there is no way that intelligence can compete, for example, with charisma or star quality. It is also true that intelligent people who are not motivated, purposeful or persistent go so far but no further in life. The converse, though, of this is that intelligence has its own justified claims. It is the proper basis for distributing the good of higher education places. Belonging to the 8% of the population with an IQ of 120 or more is an entry-level requirement for high levels of creative achievement of all kinds. Ever higher IQs do not equate with ever greater achievement. On the other hand, the 120 plus base level of high intelligence is a prerequisite for significant achievement in the professions and creative work. There are very few exceptions to this empirical pattern. While it is true that intelligence without perspiration or inspiration is void, the converse is also true. Intelligence may not be the sufficient condition, but it is certainly a necessary condition of high creative achievement in almost all cases. The rationality of the real is unbending. Intelligence is required for creative achievement, even if beyond that measure lie the unmeasurable qualities of dedication, hard work, perseverance, perversity and so on. It is widely reported that a lot of the most successful intelligent people in the world possess an antisocial streak. Those of you working in universities will not be surprised by this report. Some studies have suggested that many highly gifted scientists, like Einstein, for example, display traits that colloquially might be compared with Asperger's syndrome. We know people like this. We'd certainly not want to put such people in charge of the social committee organising the Christmas party. We're not going to make them parent of the year. They all make, universally make terrible parents. 
but we do want them at university and we do want them doing serious scientific research. In the university, their antisocial traits turn into productive persistence. They spend decades working on, on ideas that everyone else dismisses until they make a breakthrough. We are talking about a small number of people. It is a good starting point for understanding the university in general. It is best understood as a place of small numbers, not large numbers. This runs against the idea popularised by post-industrial romanticism that everyone should go to university. Intelligence is a gift or abstraction for understanding things in an abstract, that is to say, swift, shorthand way. Charles Spearman defined intelligence as the ability to see relationships between objects, events and ideas and to be able to draw inferences from those relationships. Intelligence involves uh, the ability to think quickly and persistently in abstract terms. In their survey of expert opinion, Snyderman and Rothman found that 99% of respondents identified abstract thinking or reasoning as a key aspect of intelligence. Intelligence recognises and manipulates underlying patterns or relationships quickly, whether overtly displayed in the verbal, mathematical, spatial, visual or musical domains, the underlying gift for abstraction is much the same. Uh, some people are endowed with a greater gift for abstraction than others in the same way that some people are more sociable than others, some are more courageous, and some, let me tell you, in case you don't already realise this, are more physically attractive. OK, the final section, called the status trap. This is not to say that universities always value intelligence. Before the post-industrial age, the larger society and the university were in agreement. The university was a small place, but it also played a double game that it has never ceased playing. The university has always seen itself as a place for those who are gifted in the verbal and mathematical arts and to a lesser extent in the musical and visual arts. But universities have also seen smallness as a function of social status. In the 19th century, the university was torn between being a status institution and a scholarly institution. The tear between the two has never been resolved. If anything, it has been compounded. Universities and their faculty members delight in high status. In democratic societies, this status, for the most part, is no longer modelled on patrician or aristocratic forms as it once was, but on the prestige of original knowledge and research that a small proportion of the academic staff of universities creates. About 3% of total academic staff and about 25% of faculty in the leading research universities are proficient creators of research. The high status of research in its turn attracts vast numbers of enrolling students, many of whom wish to maintain or advance their status in society. This leads to a paradox. The most competitive undergraduate teaching programs internationally are in the major research universities. These, as a result, lift in a double bind. Their status is dependent on an original knowledge production created by a minority of their staff with tiny audiences in mind, who simultaneously teach or manage student populations principally interested in winning formulas. It is not that the gulf between the two cannot be bridged. It is on a daily basis. Rather, what is noticeable is the latent cost of bridging it. The cost is the slow, almost imperceptible, but real erosion of the intellectual power of the university, as it has been compelled to revise its notion of knowledge in order to acquit itself in the post-industrial age. It has become a school or college. The distinction, the distinction between a college, university and institute is important. A college introduces students to various works of the mind. Its rationale is scholarship, literally an advanced form of schooling. An institute of technology or art has faculty who can model the creation of material artefacts. A university, in contrast, exposes students to faculty who are the creators of symbolic objects gives those who are intellectually gifted insight into the laborious business of creation. It's perfectly true that most works created are not first class or even second class, but then most eminent creators only produce great works occasionally. 
Much of what they create, which is typically a very large amount, is only average or less than average in quality, and on occasions it can be atrocious. Uh, creation is a difficult business, even for the preta naturally gifted. All that is required of great university is that, though, is that those who attend gain some insight into how creation works. That includes an insight into how laborious it is and how often it misfires. The post-industrial age was hostile to the apprenticeship model, even though it was the fashion of the 1960s to take up the cause of the working class. Post-industrialism was disdainful of work. Its utopia was play. The university of playtime, though, proved to be mediocre. To fend itself against charges of mediocrity, it wrapped itself up in social causes. Just as the great church just as the great churches used the cause of the poor to expand their influence. So the post-industrial university did the same, even if it could not offer the consolation of the afterlife. In this sense, it is the author of its own downfall. Whenever governments have wanted to expand participation by middle and upper social cohorts in education for electoral reasons, they have used as their justification the disadvantaged the lowest socio-economic status quartile. The casual assumption of governments is that the more students who come to university, the better. Yet the appeal to large numbers has difficulty standing in its own right. This is because participation beyond a threshold confounds the intrinsic nature of the university. Although they know this perfectly well, right-thinking members of the university are consoled or alternatively silenced with the thought that increasing the global rate of participation in higher education will ensure that the percentage of students from low socioeconomic backgrounds going to university will rise. But it doesn't, it can't, and it won't. The rhetorical appeal to social inclusion is deployed in ethically manipulative ways to justify increasing the global participation rate in universities a policy that consistently ends in self-defeating attrition and the production of vocationally useless degrees. Even more troubling is that after a century of adding tertiary places, societies are no better educated in real terms than when they began this process. As Nye, Goldie and Butler note, Despite the massive expansion of education in America in the 20th century, there was no accompanying increase in the verbal abilities and skills of Americans. Educational attainment in America rose from an average of 10 years in 1910 to 14 years in 1974. When researchers compared this with the scores for verbal abilities of people born between 1910 and 1974, it was found that, in spite of the much higher levels of formal education, verbal ability and skill over time had remained constant. In short, all the additional spending on education had, produ uh, all of the additional spending on education had produced no better communi communicative competencies in the population across six decades. Simple observation suggests that the same applies to writing. Consider the newspaper. I've been reading newspapers for over 40 years. When I first started reading them, they were written by journalists who had a high school education. Today, journalists have university degrees. Have newspapers improved? No. They are less well written, less accurate, less factual, more superficial and more naively ideological. That is not an improvement. What happened to journalism happened to the rest of the minor professions. They all wanted the status nominally bequeathed by degrees. By degrees. Nurses wanted to get out from under the thumb of doctors. Managers wanted to be able to override the authority of scientists and engineers. So what was proficiently learned on the job in the 1950s and 60s was migrated to colleges and polytechnics in the 1970s and 1980s, which, with a flick of the ministerial pen in 1989, magic, were turned miraculously into universities. Now, getting to the final bit. It is inconceivable now that the name university can be redeemed. It is gone forever. But that does not mean that there are not other interesting possibilities going forward. If I had to guess at what lies in the future, the OECD countries will begin to converge 
on what Simon Marginson calls the Confucian model of higher education. And I thank God for Confucius. The OECD countries have entered a prolonged age of fiscal austerity. There is no more money. Their public universities, stripped of funds, will begin to do what Australia already does. They will turn first to the international private fee-pay market. But this is really a step towards what Korea and Japan do for domestic students. They have a large sector of household-funded private and municipal universities and colleges. These enable the mass provision of certificate, diploma and degree courses. One option to move in this direction is to defund weak public institutions, which Italy is already doing and the United Kingdom is contemplating. The Confucian model matches privately financed tuition with the serious public funding of research. China gives scholarships to the top 3% of students. Australia did the same to the Whitlam Labor government abolished scholarships in 1972 in favour of free tertiary places, a fiscally impossible scheme that lasted a very short time before being scrapped. Today, 72% of places in Japanese higher education are privately funded. In Australia, the United States and China, 35% are privately financed. The corresponding figure is 27% in the United Kingdom. China is rapidly heading in the direction of Japan. From a very low base, it's moving very quickly in the Japanese direction. Now, there are two models for doing this. Everybody's familiar with what they are. One is a pure market model with upfront fees paid by families. The second is a social market model with fees recouped from graduate income via the tax system. This is more or less an Australian invention. The latter arrangement elegantly decouples access to university from the vagaries of parental income. No doubt there are many steps and many paths to get to the end game, but a modified Confucian system is consistent with what we know of the rationality of the real of higher education. It would deliver a cascading arrangement of full fellowships for the academically, able most, academically most able 2% of the population, and grants in aid, in effect, part subsidised places for the rest of the top 8%. The word university, though, is now a far too anodyne name for such publicly funded places. A name such as academies would resolve the semantic ambivalences of the multiversity. In the Neo-Confucian model, academies would be differentiated from social market universities. The social market universities would satisfy current social demand for university places whilst decoupling this demand from the public policy arena and turning universities inside out. The social mechanism of sorting individuals into status and income bands would be separated from the tiny core, of inst the tiny core institutional medium of intellectual creation. The former is an individual good albeit with some marginal social connotations, while the latter is a public good. Whether social market universities should be private or public or a melange of private and public or all of the above is beside the point. The question of large and small today... The question of large and small today is much more important than the matter of public and private. Now, I'll repeat that again, sorry. Uh, whether social market universities, this is the final paragraph, whether social market universities should be private or public or a melange of private and public or all of the above is beside the point. The question of large and small today is much more important than the matter of public and private. It is imperative that a clear line be drawn between small academies and large social market universities. In 1972, a small, strong university system existed that cost the state very little. Today, a large, weak university system exists that costs the state a lot. In fact, it costs the state so much that European, Anglo-Australian and American states can no longer afford it, not in the age of fiscal austerity. At the same time, China is raising the ante for publicly funded research. It is aggressively competing to move a lot of its universities into the global top 200. 
the first Australian university to fall to Chinese competition will be Monash, which sits right at the bottom of the top 200 universities. You are in the firing line, ladies and gentlemen. The only possible forestalling of this is a Western version of the Confucian model that privatises tuition accepting scholarships and grants in aid, socialises access to the university via the tax system and that funds elite universities or academies, in effect, to undertake research and publication and provide exemplary creative models, and this is, I think, the most important thing, is provide exemplary creative models for students for the most intellectually competitive 8% of the population. Do we have any questions? I have to go and teach a first year lecture on Derek soon, so... <laughs> Please come in, Edward. <laughs> no hint of irony there, but... Um, uh, a couple of things, very, very interesting, um, and I agree with your macro analysis, but uh, two things. One, um, uh, massification in its early stages sometimes seems to produce very interesting kind of intellectual experiments. I'm thinking, you know, Latrobe in the 60s or 70s. Every time I meet someone who did the degree there, they have these amazing recollections of you know, larger than life figures like in the Clendinen, you know, lecturing to them and, and so forth. So the same thing happened in Chicago when they decided to have undergraduates. They had this kind of college where, you know, people like C. Wright Mills and Daniel Bell were kind of teaching side by side. It was a pretty amazing kind of time. Um, but these kind of experimental situations seem to die down. Um, there's a kind of routinization of, 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 of charisma. Uh, so I'm just, I wanted to get you to comment on those moments where there are more resources, more students come in, but there seems to be, at least from the faculty side, <laughs> still a lot of energy being poured into it. And the second thing is, um, I wanted to get you to expand on, on boredom, <laughs> which was in your title, and I think you mentioned it early on. And I suppose that uh, my interest in it is, you know, that, that there's, there's boredom and boredom, and I'm also getting the feeling that um, increasingly uh, not many students would subscribe to the uh, Nietzschean maxim that, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, you know, we, we are confronted, and I don't know whether this is a product of mass education, but we are increasingly confronted by students who, you know, uh, anything that seems tedious, that's it. You know, it's very hard to get them to, to, to think about it. Um, but, you know, we know that languages or learning how to play an instrument properly or physics or, for that matter, doing multiple mm. regressions requires being bored for a while so you could master it and then, you know, you are able to, to do it. So, it's more... Yeah. Now, let me respond, I'll, I'll respond both to very briefly and very pointed answers to, to, to both of the questions there. In response to the second thing about boredom, is that um, there still is there's a yet another section of this paper and there will be a whole chapter, in fact, of, of the book that I'm writing on the question of basically uh, the, the autodidactic nature of um, uh, universities. So the, the most important quality in the university is, um, and, and I do I talk about this in the first part of the paper, is essentially self-formation and self-education and that um, all of the accounts you find, the glorious and glowing accounts of people who flourished, whether in the professions or in the, um, or later on when the universities, whatever it is, is that they had a fantastic time at university, and you see that fantastic time at university only just intersected with formal instruction. Um, and, I, and, and, what, and I did suggest it in the paper, is that, uh, here is that the emphasis is that as the whole university has undergone expansion and bureaucratisation, the move has been away from the informal media of the imagination to, to formal instruction. Uh, and, and there's an index. You, can, you could do a, a, an econometric index. Right? Max King could produce a very good econometric index, let's say, mapping as one has risen, the, the boredom threshold, um, you know, boredom has risen, in accordance with the movement from the university being an informal um, environment to being a, a pseudo-formalised, auditable, but basically, essentially, by virtue of that boring thing. And, and you notice one of the slides I put up 
was the it was the Faculty of Imagination that uh, the University of, of Melbourne was running. In, in principle, quite a good thing for undergraduate research. Um, and, and, but it's doing, trying to do institutionally what was previously and much more effectively done informally through contact between, as they say, between brilliant staff and gifted students, and that has kind of disappeared. And, 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 and therefore, the, the boredom factor has simply arisen. Uh, and that, I think, has to be... The boredom factor has to be perhaps differentiated from the dissatisfaction factor, which affects the, the, as I said, the lower third of the, of the cohort, which simply shouldn't be here. And, 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 off, and, and basically, in all the reports, that they basically, in a very friendly fashion, actually say that as they exit the place, it's just not for me. So the, what's the, the there's measurement? There's data on boredom. Well, what there isn't and done... It's different from faculty to faculty because, yeah. at least anecdotally, I've heard from people I know that the boredom who have worked in various faculties that boredom, for example, in, in medicine is less discernible than it is in, yeah. in the humanities, for example. So yeah. I just wonder what... Yeah, you... yeah. Manish has got some um, 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 data on boredom um, which I haven't been able to lay my hands on. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I have to say, and that really is, I, I think one of the things that's most shocked me by doing this work in, in the last four, four, four months or so is how terrible uh, the data is. Um, and, and, and the, I mean, the social science, it's a kind of pseudo-social science that underlies so many of these reports. And um, as far as the, who's it? The, 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 nationally, if we look at nationally. I understand Monash has got some figures, but if we look at nationally. Uh, nobody actually asks the, the, the top-ranking um, students whether they're in, engaged with the university. Um, um, but I, I, I think one of the historical da- one of the historical things we do know about the university is, in any case, um, and there is some very good longitudinal, long-term data about high achievers, people who go on for you know really, really distinguished high achievement, is um, they all tend to drop out at some point out of, out, out of the university. Um, and what is... In, um, it tends to be at the end of second year, uh, if you've got an arts background, and it tends to be at, at the beginning of, of, of postgraduate study in the sciences. I mean, there is that kind of differential. There is a, there is a kind of dropout factor... And, and um, one, one in the unspoken part of my paper here, one of the things I say about that is that there is, in general terms, a, a, an extraordinary challenge that universities, even under best conditions, have of meeting the expectations of the very brightest students because frequently the very brightest students exceed the talents of those who are teaching them. And, 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 this is, and this is a long-term problem. It's a long-term problem that is made now much worse by what's happened, particularly in the last 20 years, but more generally in the last 50 years. Yeah, it's impacted on by teaching practices, such as teaching enormous um, groups. We were just talking about this before in the paper, teaching tutorials in lecture rooms uh, and dumbing down the discourse in order to try and communicate with the weaker students and, and thereby marginalising the brighter students. So that, that's this, exactly. this is a, a, a day-to-day issue. That's exactly what happens, and in a sense what I find in a way scandalous about the, the database that's been accumulated for policy over the last 20 years it, it, is that it clearly refuses to collect data related to this. I mean, there is a willful political design not to collect data to, 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 which would demonstrate exactly what we know is in fact the case. So, uh, so there are real issues about the absolutely cruddy nature of the social science being driven, uh, driving national policy. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the paper, Peter. Uh, nearly all of which I agree with, actually, um, apart from the Snyder remark about utopias. Uh, <laughs> the is a literary form. Um, <laughs> and this has a sort of dystopian side. Um, yeah. Actually, but, but, uh, well, it's not just... You, know, you started with William, but you could go right back to... I mean, uh, there are lots and lots. It's an important thing. Uh, I, Jude the Obscure, yeah, obviously an example. I'm sure there are lots more. And there are lots of examples, apart from Hegel, of no lecture notes. So Sir was the one that I was thinking of. Of course, in general linguistics, is, is lecture notes. Reconstructive lecture notes. Anyway, that wasn't... Uh, most of what I said I agree with. I'm sceptical, however, about... Right at the beginning, you said that... I mean, the, the, the key transformation is, is the abolition, or blurring. Normally abolition, 
of a binary system. Yeah. Um, uh, and that, that's actually, if you want to have real universities, <coughs> whatever you call them, that's what you have to reverse. And I agree with that. Mm. I think that's, that's the central part of the drive. Um, you, you, but you said at the beginning that that was not to do with economic rationalisation. In, in, in the outcome, you're almost certainly right. Um, uh, given this, the huge cost is, that, it, that the state has incurred to no, to no real effect. Yeah. However, I, I think it's very important to go back and recognise that, that e economic rationalisation and perhaps an economic rationalism were a strong part of the ideological justification for the process. I mean, the, probably the most persuasive part. The socially inclusive engineering was always tied to the idea that somehow this would grab, grab, generate more economic productivity. Um, and uh, and, and I, I, th I think you need to acknowledge that. In particular, it, it actually seems to me it, it, it explains. I mean, one of the things that's always puzzled me. Um, well, no, I'm interested in the question mm. of, of why uh, Labour parties were so keen on, on this development. Um, and I, I actually think it's, it's a double-sided thing. I, I mean, it seems to me that Labour MPs are an interesting... I mean, I suspect they have a very similar background to me. Uh, that is, that for them, edu higher education was socially transformative and meant for social mobility. Um, and therefore, they're, they're inclined to believe that that's genuinely... Yeah. Uh, that this is generalisable. I suspect that, that, that Dawkins probably thought this was true. Mm. Um, uh, but the other thing that's important about Labour and police is that they used to be, mm. they used to represent working class, a working class constituency mm. and be in favour of some kind or other of socialism, mm. and now they're not. Um, and I don't. Noticed it, yeah. And because they don't believe in any kind of socialism... <laughs> they don't any, believe in anything, actually. Well, no, actually, I suspect... Apart from their own self-pituation. I, <laughs> I think they believe in the market, you see, uh, and the economy. I think, this, I think education education is a functional... It's, it's, not, it's an alternative for having any, any distinctive belief system. And I think that, that helps to explain why Labour has been so committed to this whole business. Um, uh, and is it, is it, that, that, I, I, think the, I think some of this is, is a lot of what's <coughs> happened has been market driven more than you admit but where it's not been market driven it's been driven by the ideology of the market uh, and that I think did affect labor, labor politics pretty gen generally in the, uh, over this whole question of the way the universities have developed and that's why I actually think I mean once I mean, most of what you say I think, I think it's terribly important to recognise that, 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 that the way one of the things that the traditional universities did uh, like traditional, like uh, many other elite institutions, they aim to, to immunise their activities against the market uh, and, and the state. <laughs> and, I, and I still think if, if, you're, if you are to achieve the kind of academy that you're talking about, that needs to be done. Mm. That's why I'm not even sure that a social market solution is what you need. I mean, you, you, I, I'm quite happy to accept that you, you need, uh, I mean, 8%. Well, it might be the number that you'd be willing to fund publicly. Mm. Um, but I think it probably a generous system of scholarships is exactly what you need, precisely because um, you, you, need, you need to immunise that not just the research, but even the entry of, of, of students hmm. against market pressures. Yeah. You, and you do, actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the, the. You and I, as on many things, don't disagree markedly, in fact, about this. I, I think one of the conclusions I've come to is that um, a watershed was passed in, in 2008, 2008, 2010, a bit like happened in the mid-1980s. Um, you know, there's, there's these kind of invisible watersheds. And I think now that you can actually look back now and say uh, there is a period, and a period which was underpinned by a paradigm. The curious thing is it's not quite clear what that paradigm was still. I mean, for all of the, the vast amount of talk and in, in indeed research that went on about, I mean, initially about Thatcherism, right, and they defined the 80s in terms of Thatcherism and Reagan. But then people discovered that, um, in fact, Blair and um, whatever did, you know, the, the same kinds of things. And then, in fact, they discovered uh, Clinton. The, the Clinton was the man. Clinton, or, or that the, the Thatcherite policies were, in fact, um, enacted in Australia by a Labour government. And so, when you look back, it's kind of there's a version of twiddle dee and twiddle dum here. And um, but, but I mean, it, it's as there so often is in in political and social periods that the actors who've, who who furiously argue with one another 
often have much more in agreement. They're often much more in agreement than they are actually. So, so it's the you know it's the, the narcissism of tiny differences comes to to to, to the fore. Um, I, I know what's made now. I'm, I'm increasingly sceptical. And, and the, the thing about the, my comment about economic rationalism was, in fact, it was more a, a, a reference to sort of draw out comments like yours, in in the sense of. Just to say now how difficult it actually is to understand what went on in that period. Because, in fact, all of the political actors, um, even though they used slightly different languages and had slightly different rhetoric about it, and, and some was more market focused and some was about social opportunity and all this kind of stuff, what was going on was remarkably shared across the board. What I'm saying now is that something fundamental has happened, it's no longer affordable. Um, you know, you look at the, the biggest growth in higher education places in Australia in the past 50 years happened under Howard in, in, the, in the latter part, at Kemp and Howard. Um, and, and, and so it didn't, looking back on it now, politically um, uh, there was much more shared. And what, how are we, I don't know how to describe that. So all I can say is something weird went on there. And it's very difficult to sum it up. What about the future now? Well, I think we've now one past a, a threshold where there, there are fundamental changes afoot. The trouble is nobody can actually describe what those changes are. I mean, you know, and, and, and part of my, the last part of the paper was trying to give some indication of what the changes may be and, and, and a hint at, at some of the language that could be but not, not necessarily will be used. Um, but I think we're, we're in a very interesting position now where um, everything is up for grabs and um, the, the preceding model simply has no future legs um, because of the money situation. The money's gone, there ain't no more money there and, and, and therefore I think it's an interesting time, which is actually why I'm writing the book on the universities, to actually now write a book on the universities in the same way that the 1980s I think was, was an can, interesting can time. Back to the, I agree with that, that diagnosis of the situation. Uh, and... Uh, um, I mean, the, the interesting thing is how it's going. I mean, I, I, I put my position in too conservative because I said simply restore the binary system. And that, you probably can't. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, 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 no, well, I'm, 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 I'm saying, saying that. You're, I'm you're saying that. A different, more I'm saying that. Way it. Yes, that's right. I, I agree okay. with that. But of course, one possibility, I mean, you have to ask the question how, can you, how do you sell that? Uh, how, how do intellectuals sell that to, to politicians uh, or, or businessmen? Or, uh, um, now, the answer has to be. The only possible answer in, in, in your framework is in, t is in terms of the necessity of, of, for a society to have, a, have, have, to have some intellectuals, right? Um, but, the, but there is an answer. I mean, well, there are other possibilities. Uh, but the most depressing one would be that actually no, each society doesn't need intellectuals. Um, that, uh, that we will have these sorts of institutions and they'll be in the United States and they'll serve, and they'll service the whole of the OECD. Yes, that is one outcome. I, 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 I just given recently given a paper at the University of Melbourne saying a version of that, which is to say everybody's talking about the rise of China, and my response is, listen, folks, let's get serious here. Um, you know, there, there only remains one serious university system, which is that of the United States. Mm, that's right. It's extraordinarily powerful. Um, and so there are some good universities out there. Well. Well. Well, you're quite right. Ab 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 there's no question mm. about that. I, I think the, the, the real challenge, as I, as I said at the end, is China, uh, because China is going to put a huge amount of money into elite universities. Um, and basically, it means that um, a large number in the, 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 um, the second 100 league are, are going to get kicked out. Um, and, and basically that, that's my response to the political challenge mm -hmm. and, and I mean in a sense it's not just abstract intellectualism um, it's, it's actually international competitiveness and if Australia which has a number of universities it's in most of its group of eight are in the second group in the, in, you know, in the, in the, in the second tier of the, the top 200 uh, between you know, 200 and 100 somewhere they wish to stay there they have to, uh, the Australian government will have to deal with it. If not, they will simply go down the, down the chute, basically. Does, this, does it matter terribly if they're not in the top 200? 
Um, it matters to the Vice Chancellor, I know, enormously, and I shouldn't be saying it anyway in the you know, no, no. 100 miles of him. No. But does it matter? No, well, it, it simply is, there's two answers to the question. There, mm. there's, there's, there's the, the question of intellectual substance, right? If you've got serious universities of high quality... And there are a lot of people in China, they ought to be in the top two. Yeah. And there is. If you've got serious universities with high quality... You, they, they will, in, just as a matter of fact, rank high. I mean, you cannot engineer sure. ranking. So in that sense, it simply doesn't matter. But my, my answer to, to, to Andrew's question was more of, of, of the game of politics, which is, which is partially separable from, from the questions of, of intrinsic intellectual substance and, 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 and only at a certain point cross over or connect with the questions of, of, of intellectual substance. Do, I, do our politicians care much about intellectual substance? No, but only insofar as they manifest themselves in things like rankings and stuff like that. I mean, uh, does industry care? They care a bit more. I mean, it's very interesting what, say, the British Confederation of Industry said when the, the new Conservative government was elected, knowing the budget cuts that were coming. They said two things. They said protect serious universities and chop the funding for, 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 for the academic and the weak now hoping universities and send them in the marketplace where they can survive in the marketplace. So that's the answer of business. And, and a business actually may be much more sympathetic to... Because business, look, if you look at the, the rankings in terms of, 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 of um, IQ scores and entries into graduate programs and so on, uh, most of the top, apart from um, 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 economics and philosophy, uh, are sciences. Engin the serious sciences, serious engineering. To do serious engineering and, ser and serious science, um, uh, you have to have top-rate minds. Um, and, and that then becomes crucial to long-term economic performance. If you have a serious economy today, you need serious science because serious science drives serious um, business and industry. Um, and maybe so, globally. So, maybe uh, globally, whether it's true in Australia is another point. Uh, of course, but in, 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 if that's true then from a political point of view, and this is to answer both of your questions, in a sense, it then becomes the more cynical motivations, the more sort of press motivations, like how do universities rank internationally? Like, you know, um, and, um, and, um, um, and look, I, I tell you, look, I mean, if you... No, I'll stop there. I'll allow for other questions. Stuart, um, can you uh, elaborate on Yeah, can you elaborate on what you mean by Confucian? How are you using it? Yeah, alright, well, I borrowed the term from my, my um, friend Simon Marginson, um, who's just written, it hasn't been published yet, but written an extremely interesting paper on, um, um, well, it was about global universities, but about the, the role of, of East Asia, or the powerful East Asian countries and their, and their university systems. And so I'm, I'm just, in, in some sense, just simply picking up on that, that there are certain um, um, characteristics of those systems. And if you're talking about philosophically about 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 um, it's simply societies that um, um, uh, value um, well, education becomes um, is important socially. There are certain societies in which a education is valued. Uh, but these are societies in which education is valued not in some general sense, uh, but it's, uh, well, it is valued in some general sense, but it's also valued in a narrow sense, which is to say that there has been a traditional historic relationship between education and Chinese elites over a long period of time. Including Japan in that? Yeah, uh, Confucian in, in, the, in the very large sense. In the, in the very large so sense I taught the Japanese system, including at their number one university, it's a terrible university at least in the areas that I was teaching. The, the boredom factor was very, very high. Yeah. Well, that's, of course, local, cultural, demographic and environmental factors always at work in, in, in any of these paradigms. And um, that would be one example. Yeah. I, I wouldn't disagree. I'm, 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 I think principally what I'm doing in this last part of the paper is I'm looking around for a, a word as a, as a, as a differentiator. I, I, in a sense... I'm less concerned with particularly what happens in East Asia and more concerned with finding a, a marker to indicate two things. One, where we might head, and two, where what are the kinds of, 
drivers of the prevailing winds of, of the future. And, and clearly the East Asian system generally, certainly because of its growing social weight, will join with the United States and Europe as a long-term determiner of things like education systems, simply because of the size, size of these systems. And what happens is that governments around the world tend to model themselves on what's happening in other places because that's the default lazy political uh, position. And I'm certainly extrapolating from that. Um, and in fact, the last paper I gave again at, at Melbourne was precisely to say the same point. Um, look, if we're talking about serious, high-level intellectual production, then where's the future lies? It lies still with the United States. It's, 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 it, it, and, and so in that sense, look, I completely agree. Yes. So. I think I was thinking that, in a sense, this paper needs a kind of pre-paper to deal with the secondary school system. Because why are you talking about mastication of the tertiary sector? You've got arguably privatisation of the secondary school system where geography and income still are the key factors in terms of who, who's, who's delivered up to, to the top university. I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because this paper and the larger project really arose out of an invitation which I'm going to deliver a paper at um, an equity and, big ed, equity and education conference paper coming up soon. Uh, they must have known that I was the person to ask to, to talk on the subject of equity in education. Um, <laughs> you know, life is a strange thing. Um, but this is actually a serious topic, um, and I think, and, and basically, I'm, well, I mean, I agree with you, you're perfectly right. Um, and the thing, though, that I'm going to say in that paper is that much of the same things that one says about equity in, about, equity in placement and access to universities and um, the entry of the, 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 the last 25% quartile into universities and all those kind of figures and so on, um, the same issues but greater apply in, in secondary and primary schooling uh, because you're not going to... Um, in, 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 uh, move from effectively the 11 to 15 percent uh, that are going into tertiary, um, un unless you, unless there is a, a, a changed performances at the, the, at the you know, through education generally. However, but the point that I want to make about this is that um, what I'm going to talk about in that paper is that the most um, interesting current research, and it's fascinating research on. Um, it says that there's all the traditional sociological criteria about getting to university. Who gets to university? Right? Which fascinates our generation for some reason, which I don't understand. Um, it says people trot out the traditional sociological markers, right? Uh, oh, it's parental income, it's parental education, it's your know, father's income, father's education, all of these kinds of things, you know, sort of 101 sociology. Well, like, my, 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 like one much 101 sociology, it leaves a lot to be desired. And very interesting research which suggests that, in fact, a, a much better indicator of getting to university um, are home libraries. Um, and, um, and, and I'd like to see some research now done on public libraries. Um, uh, but basically, it doesn't matter whether you come from a really super poor family uh, or whether you come from, well, let's say you come from a super poor family um, or a, an advantaged family and so on, um, the, greatest in, the greatest indicator of long term success. A uh, much higher, better indicator than income, a much better indicator than uh, parental, liberal parental education um, is the size of the home library that you grew up with. So if you come from a poor background, um, you know, that's disadvantaged in all the traditional criteria, uh, but somehow there are books around, and if you read those books, and, and then there's very um, multinational studies going across 40 countries, providing data and evidence for this, is that if you have access to books and you are autodidactic, uh, you will have a very good chance of getting to university and doing well. And one of the themes that's emerging in the book that I'm writing is the power of autodidacticism. 
uh, both at university and running up to, to university. And I'm starting to think about the public policy um, it should take much more interest in libraries, for example, school libraries, um, local libraries, um, state libraries, and then it does in a lot of the junk equity programs that I can tell you don't work because there is extremely powerful social science evidence to suggest that they actually do not work and that they're a total waste of money. You still need the university places, though, don't you? I think Brett wants to come in. We've got about 30 seconds. <laughs> You've actually, for the first time ever, Mark Lake and Marvin Wright about something. You know, these reading programs. But look. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm delighted to hear that Mark Lake and I share something yeah. in common. <laughs> well, I, going back to the boredom question. Yeah, I, okay. I, I've been in three reasonably heated arguments with various people who work for media companies and an IT company of late. Um, and the boredom fact, in terms of, I mean, I understand taking aim at social policy, but also the marrying of what's happened to the CCA and TAFE system, I find deeply distressing for, Me a, whole, too. for a whole heap of that reasons. Because what it's allowed is universities to hollow those out on the way down. Absolutely. Um, and this leads to the boredom factor where, you know, industry, you know, you get sort of, sort of informal compact between government and industry saying the job of universities is to train people for industry, to which my response is, well, industry pay for your own training. That's not what we do. Um, but again, like if you speak to them, they, they genuinely believe that the job of a university is to simply pump them out ready workers rather than ready thinkers. Can I, can I two responses to this? What Brett said is absolutely spot on, let me say. Two... Two responses very quickly to that. First of all, to the question of TAFE sector. Right? If you look at the figures on the TAFE sector in terms of numbers of, of the population, the percentage per, per capita of the population participating in things, over the relevant period from the late 80s onwards, it's remained static while universities have boomed. The Labor government was in power for a large part, for a you know, significant part of that, part of that period. Um, from the mid-80s onwards, the mid-80s to the mid-90s, right? During that period, it remained static. I regard that as a total scandal, yeah. basically. An, abso ab an absolute criminal scandal. It's why apprenticeship has become hereditary. Yeah. You may yeah, yeah because your dad teaches you. Your teach you yeah, whatever. Oh. I, I think it's an, abs a, an absolute unmitigated scandal uh, for which a number of people should simply be summarily taken out and shot. I mean, seriously, because this is, this is I mean, a good society needs a purple, large number of people with, with, with technical trade skills and competencies. Um, on the relation of business industry, when we had small universities, when um, brilliant staff and gifted students mingled together, they formed lifelong relationships. Now we have crap things called ARC linkage grants. <laughs> Okay. Sorry, just one question very briefly and then we'll do a bit of final question so we can keep the cutting off discussion. I don't know whether I have a question, but I have a couple of responses to the yeah. First of all, in terms of the bottom, you know, black to techno control of that, it's not easy to kind of to overgeneralize or to make stereotypes about the university and and I I my understanding is that you seem to talk about the university in the Anglo in a section world rather than university in a scene which cover all parts of the world because where I come from and then myself being studied in four different universities, I, I can't relate myself to the broader factor that you, you know, I've been discussing. And then number two, it seems that your paper is rather pessimistic, <laughs> suggesting that you know the university is kind of going to an end and then it's terrible, it's going backward. No, I think there are a lot of factors underlying this, and also I'm, I come from education myself and then being familiar with the, your work and then Simon Matchison's work and a couple of other people like Michael Apple has a risk in in talking about education. I, I think that, you know, it is perhaps the very uh, fundamental concept of the enjoyment of learning has been ignored in your paper. Uh, I don't know, just, just my uh, response to that. And then the third point regarding uh, global ranking. I think the practice of global ranking 
is meant to promote certain university and marginalize other universities. And again, your question whether it matters to be ranked in the top 200 universities. Now, I, I did my both bachelor degrees in Vietnam, the so-called top university in Vietnam, the National University of the Vietnam Diplom um, Academy of Diplomacy. And then we, we are not ranked, perhaps maybe not even in the top 500 university. But so what? So many graduate from those two universities now they become leaders in many, many fields worldwide, not necessarily just nationally, but internationally. And then I myself have been to even picking universities, the so-called top university in China. And then be familiar with so many universities, and I, I find quite hard to, to relate to the global ranking system. And one fundamental criterion that I often find missing in such a, a scale when you do global ranking is that how satisfied are you and as a student with the social engagement that your university is being you know, involved in. But so I, I feel that there, there lacks that engagement in, in, in many universities. Here, for example, I find perhaps we, we are separated from or isolated from the society in many, many ways, even though paradoxically when Western universities talk about themselves to the world, they seem to promote themselves as being highly democratic, engaging critical thinking and that sort of thing. But at the same time, I feel that just like, you know, working in the vacuum machine, it lacks the human thing so much. Whereas in Vietnam, I don't know, we, we have a lot of social engagement. We have the ideology, and perhaps that is the very thing that drives us forward, rather than being running top 100, top 50. So I don't know, just some responses to your paper. Okay, look, okay. There's, there's a number of things I want to take up there. Um, let, let me respond in some detail to this, because these are very interesting observations. Um, I'm no great fan of ranking systems. I just observe that look, that they have emerged in other since 2003, quite recently. They simply they emerge for particular reasons. Things happen for a reason, and and and, and they've emerged to deal with some of the the problems of to do with the, the, the immense proliferation of universities, and and the desire on the part of actors within university systems and governments to to make. Um, to, to, to draw some kinds of distinctions. And, I mean, once you get to the size that universities have grown, there are about 15,000 universities worldwide that call themselves universities. People will look for drawing certain um, distinctions. Those distinctions used to be drawn in different kinds of ways. I mean, until the end of the 1980s, we drew very clear distinctions between universities, colleges, institutes, and so on. As that system has broken down, people have felt some you know, basic psychological need to, to reintroduce a set of distinctions. And beyond that, I don't personally really care about the ranking system, except for the fact that human beings rank things. They do that anyway. So that if you're in China or Vietnam or you're in the UK or Australia, I guarantee you everybody who's an actor in the society makes certain discriminations and they, they engage in certain judgments which involve ranking. And, and, and people make decisions based on whether it's automobiles or universities or politicians or whatever, they, they, they make judgments of, 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 of value and, and, and so on. Um, as far as social engagement's going, now there's an interesting question here because if we go back to uh, 100 years ago in, in this system or in, in Australia or the UK or Austria or Germany and so on, uh, if you were a professor in a university, you would be a major public actor. And it is to say, as well as doing your, um, what would to be your, um, you know, uh, writing your books or your scholarly articles and so on, you're guaranteed um, uh, that you would be a, 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 a commentator on public affairs and often hold public positions. Um, so if you take for the two greatest economists of the 20th century, both academics, um, uh, Schumpeter and Keynes, also held um, a public, various forms of public office and so on. That has certainly declined with the passage of time. I, I, I observe that to be the case. I, I'm, I don't think that that's necessarily a good thing, uh, but, but, but it has, and um, in generally speaking, you know, universities and, and educational systems generally um, in... Uh, certainly Western societies have become um, detached from the larger society. I suspect it's the same in Japan. Uh, it may be a larger condition of the, sort of the, the larger sort of modernising process 
uh, whether it will apply eventually in Vietnam um, and, uh, it, and, um, and, and China, uh, it's likely to do so. Uh, there are some deficits of being closely connected with political systems, I hasten to add, um, and uh, that's not always a good thing for the, for the mind. Um, and one of the arguments for separating political and educational systems is it increases the freedom of the mind, though I'm also not a believer that uh, Western universities are particularly institutions that are given to, to great freedom of the mind. In principle, yes, but in practice there is a huge amount of intellectual orthodoxy that pervades those systems. So um, a lot of correct thinking, right thinking and marching together in groups, hordes and packs tends to be the basic um, intellectual nature of those, of, of those universities. And again, I think it's a symptom that of, of the general intellectual orthodoxy that reigns in, in um, Western, in, in European and American universities. Everybody says much the same thing uh, in much the same sort of forums, indicates that not all is well in those places and that there are long-term problems of high intellectual culture and its ability to, to say and do interesting things. Whether that's solved with a connection with the, the social or political systems or social engagement, it depends. I mean, you know, there, there, are, there are pluses and minuses in, in doing that. Well, but these are real issues. So. I shall um, call it close there because it's just on going on 10 past. So um, if we could thank Peter for...